welcome to you all to this uh, interview session with Kishore Mababani. Uh, I assume because you're here, you probably have some idea who he is, but let, let me uh, introduce him briefly. Kishore's a former head of the Singaporean Foreign Ministry, twice ambassador to the United Nations, now dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School at uh, NUS. Uh, he's a man who's written about how one of the characteristics of Asians is, is a willingness to avoid conflict, but thankfully he doesn't <laughs> nat always live up to that himself, <laughs> and so makes for a lively discussion and is, is prepared to take things on. Yeah. Uh, his most recent book is called The New Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Shift of Global Power to the East. Uh, Kishore, um, it's, a, it's a great read, and I was very struck in the opening chapters, the way in which you weave in your own personal mm. story and the transformation in, you, in your life mm -hmm. with the, the broader story of the rise of Asia. Could you perhaps recap some of that for, for the audience? Well, I decided to begin uh, on a very personal note because I r suspect that very few people could realize that you could actually grow up in a, with five of us living in a one-room house in Singapore, in a typical developing country with no flush toilet, uh, until the age of 10, with racial riots uh, at my doorstep, with uh, people cutting each other with bottles. Uh, and I saw that as a 10-year-old child, you know, right in front of my house. So to grow up in a sort of uh, very typical third world environment, and then in the course of my li own lifetime, to sort of live in a, f in a, in a first world society, I believe that the journey that I traveled uh, is one that is now going to be traveled by hundreds of millions of people, if not billions of people. And the critical thing I realized that to succeed, you actually got to believe that you can succeed. And I, can, I mean, to be very candid, when I grew up in a, as a child in Singapore, and it was a British colony until I was about 11 years old, I actually believed that I was ethnically inferior that the, whatever we call the white man, the Westerner, was naturally superior, naturally was smarter, performed better, and we Asians would always be second class. And then in the course of my lifetime, again, to see this complete reversal of roles, where now if you go to American universities, uh, many of the Western kids complain there are too many Asian Americans in my class, too many Asians are Asian in my class, I can't compete with these bloody Indians and Chinese, why is life so unfair? <laughs> And that, you know, you just imagine that, you know, that would have been inconceivable when I was in school or university, and now you have this complete reversal. And that's why I wanted to put it in, in personal terms, because when you multiply it by hundreds of millions and billions, you realize that this really is a big story. And do you think that that's a, a story in a way that unites very disparate parts of Asia? Because mm. in a way, that's something that the Chinese are going through, that Indians are going through mm. as well, and it creates a sort of pan-Asian sympathy. They understand mm. that mm. there's a sloughing off of uh, old poverty, but also mm. psychological burdens. Yeah. Well, I think that was the big advantage, actually. You know, when you grow up as a minority, ethnic minority, within a minority, I grew up as an ethnic Sindhi, and the Indians are only 6% of the population, the Sindhi is only 10,000 people, and in a Chinese majority society, I could actually, I found through my personal experience as an Indian, I could connect with the over a billion people in India. Growing in a, a Chinese majority society, I could connect directly with the one billion people in China. And both our neighbors, ironically, my, we were Hindu refugees from Pakistan when my mother arrived in Singapore in 47. And all through my childhood, both our neighbors were Muslims. <laughs> And so again, we had a very close relationship with our Muslim neighbors, and that enabled me to also connect with the Islamic world. And I think it's the capacity to understand the three of the biggest streams in Asia that enables me to write so confidently that when I speak about Asia, it actually applies not just to the Chinese in Singapore, or the Malays in Singapore, or Indians in Singapore, it applies to much larger societies. Well, I've seen them. And what if I were to say to you, but hang on, Kicho, we're talking about 40% or more of the world's population. Is it even conceivable that one can generalize about such a huge group? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure when you dig deep into it, there will be uh, lots of differences. But, you know, what's interesting to me is watching the Asian reactions to my writing, okay? And I get 
very large uh, block of sympathy in China. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, uh, my Chinese name, uh, Ma Kai Shou, mm -hmm. is very well known in China. <laughs> if you Google it, I'm uh, better known in the Chinese speaking world than I am in the English speaking world. And if I travel to India, uh, uh, of course, quite naturally, there's an affinity because of my ethnic background. But also, frankly, when I go to Iran or when I go to the Arab-speaking world and when people have watched me, for example, on BBC Hard Talk at the interview, I got emails from Morocco, from China, from uh -huh. India saying, hey, we're glad you spoke up for us. And when you're speaking up for us, so to speak, uh -huh. are you in a sense also telling the West off and saying, look, we've, we've had it with being lectured to by the West? Is that mm. part of the message? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as you know, we, we, one of the most significant uh, aspects of the era we're entering now is what I call the end of the era of Western domination of world history. And this domination was overwhelming for over 200 years. And so you, it's, like, it's like layers of Western influence that have been wrapped around the world. And now these layers of Western influence are being unwrapped around the world. And in the process, all kinds of minds are changing. And I found it, one of the things that I found most puzzling is that the Western societies are supposed to be among the most open societies in the world, the most receptive to new ideas, but they've been very resistant to accepting this idea that this, the, we're reaching the end of the era of Western domination of world history. And part of the reason why, I, as you know, I write things as, as sharply as I do, uh, the reason I do that is to provide a kind of wake-up call to the West and say, stop trying to do things in the same old way that you did before. Accept the fact that you've got to share power with the rest of the world. And essentially, the, 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 the good news that I have for the Western world, and, and, I, and I want to emphasize this because, as you know, there's so much pessimism today sure. in the I West. It's sort of, it's, it's sort, it's sort of, uh, in, so, it's so ironic that I, as an Asian, now mm feel obliged to inject some optimism into the Western world and say, don't, 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 it's not over, it's not over, you haven't <laughs> lost everything, you got hope, you got hope, keep on fighting, you can do it, you know. <laughs> so it's sort of ironic that someone with my background is now telling the West, you know, don't is, give is up. Is it also enjoyable in the West? <laughs> <laughs> now that's getting too personal. <laughs> No, I, I think, well, it, what, I, 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 uh, the reason why I studied philosophy uh, mm. at the National University of Singapore is because I like the clash of ideas. So mm. what I enjoy is actually meeting uh, a formidable debater and then having a good debate because uh, it's, it's my nature. Yeah. And, so, and, and, and then having to deal with so much Western arrogance, you know, which I can tell you at the end of the Cold War was amazing. And it was my good fortune that I was in Harvard in 91, 92, at the peak of the Francis Fukuyama essay, The End of History. And I remember many of the Harvard professors just found it inconceivable that there could be any other road of history except the Western road of history. And that's when I began to realize, hey, they've got to listen to something new. Okay, now you've argued that the that West can learn now having dished mm. out lessons for many years to the rest mm. of the world, now needs to learn some lessons. And I think Mm. One of the things you think is that the West has become very unpragmatic, as you put it, mm. and that Asians are more mm. pragmatic. Could you, could you expand on that? Well, I think if you look uh, at this crisis, just in the last three years, okay, right. what's happened? And I think, the, firstly, if you look at the causes, in the case of the United States of America, to put it very bluntly and briefly, Alan Greenspan actually believed ideologically that markets were smarter than governments. Let the invisible hand do all the work and everything would be okay. And that was a huge ideological mistake he made. The Asians never believed that. The Asians believe you need the invisible hand of free markets and the visible hand of good governance. So you have to combine the two. And I always say somewhat unkindly, in the, in the land of the two-handed, the one-handed is at a disadvantage. <laughs> so, so that's why I think, and I think the role of government, and, and Ronald Reagan, unfortunately, he was a great president in many other ways. One of the worst things he ever said, which I think damaged Western society, was his line, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And I can tell you the one thing that virtually all Asian societies agree upon is that you need government. Societies need government because if you don't have government, things will get much, much worse. And therefore, as you know, in the Chinese mindset, uh, 
the thing that they fear more is not the lack of freedom. The thing that they fear most is chaos, Luan. You, you and that's why having strong governance is so important. And frankly, as it now turns out, the big lesson of this last crisis is that you need to emphasize and, and develop good governance in all societies. And for the West, it'll be very painful backtracking from the ideological positions they used to take. You've gone further, I think, uh, in my own newspaper and argued mm. that the West is, one of its problems is it tells itself lies. Now, mm. what do you mean by that? Well, I think, frankly, you know, and even listening to Chancellor Merkel uh, yesterday here, I mean, the one thing that Asians have learned, because the Asians actually have struggled enormously uh, to escape two centuries of inferior performance. And the lesson that they have learned after two centuries of struggle is that change doesn't come easily. That to succeed, you have to have painful sacrifice, you have to work harder, and you have to you know, sacrifice for the long term. And I find not a single Western politician not Obama in his State of the Union speech, not Chancellor Merkel yesterday speaking to us, will use the word sacrifice and say, I'm sorry, the good times are over, we can get them back, but let's work harder, let's sacrifice now, and then we can transform and change. But the word sacrifice, I, I've been waiting for one major Western politician to use it. But don't Asians you know, some Asian countries also tell lies just of a, of a different sort. I mean, if you yeah. think, say, when China says, well, we've arrested Ai Weiwei because there's mm. something wrong with his taxes, that's mm. a lie. Mm. Well, it is a fact that all governments lie. Mm. I have not yet found a single government right. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't lie to its people. And frankly, if any government decides to be truth 100% of the time, it obviously hasn't read Machiavelli and, and doesn't realize that that's not how you run governments. And from time to time, you've got to shape messages and all so on and so forth. But the question is the degree uh, of lying. And here, one of the biggest failures in Western understanding of China is that they see the Communist Party and they assume that the Communist Party is a dictatorial force sitting down and oppressing the Chinese people. Actually, the last 30 years of Chinese Communist Party rule have been the best 30 years that the Chinese have enjoyed in the last 200 years. And they do see the Chinese Communist Party rule as having liberated them from lots of things. So as long as there is, uh, the, chi the Chinese population considers the government legitimate, right? Mm. There is a bond between the two, it can carry on. Because the Chinese Communist Party is acutely aware that the minute they stop performing, the minute they stop delivering economic growth, they can be gone very quickly. Mm. Okay. So there is a social contract over there that exists. And the difference is that, the reason why I say there's greater lies in the West than in the East is because the social contract is broken down because people don't um, realize that they've got to make some fundamental transformations if the West is going to turn around. Yeah. Now, a popular debate in the West and also in Asia as well is, is this contrast between China and India. You know, who, mm. will, who will succeed better? Mm. Will it be the democratic mm. system of India or the more authoritarian one-party system of mm. China? Where do you come down on that debate? Or do you see that as a misleading debate and the commonalities being more interesting? I, I, I think, frankly, both will succeed. You know, uh, but both will succeed differently. I mean, China will succeed because of its government India will succeed despite this government. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, and they are very, very different. So, so I mean, in that as sense, people you believe that own. democracy is a disadvantage for uh, India? No, 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 not at all. In fact, I, I, I do think that all societies have to become democratic eventually. And that's actually a competitive advantage that India has over China because China will have to make a painful transition to democracy uh, at some point in time. But the, the critical thing, as I explained in my book, is that the reason why both are succeeding is because they're both understood, absorbed, and are implementing what I call you know, seven pillars of Western wisdom. So I give the West a lot of credit for the success of Asia. And it is these things like free market economics, the mastery of science and technology, the culture of pragmatism, meritocracy, all these things, they're implementing in their own way. Mm. And that's why I think both will succeed. Mm.
What about this uh, issue that I raised in the introduction, this question of conflict avoidance? I mean, you, mm. I think, think that the West in recent years has made a mistake by sort of looking for fights around the world, mm. particularly in the Middle East, and that mm. Asians, uh, say in yeah. Burma, have taken a different view. Yeah, I think the, the thing that's most surprising is that internally within the Western universe, within the European Union, within North America, there's total peace. But the United States has, I mean, I like the United States, but you know, to be objective, has emerged as the most trigger-happy country uh, in the last 10, 20 years. And I think it's got to learn that war is not the solution. It wasn't the solution in Iraq. It's not going to be the solution in Iran. And if you compare and contrast, you know, when we decide to adopt a long-term policy of engaging Myanmar, Burma, everybody laughed at ASEAN and said, you're not going to change the military regime through this kind of engagement process. And believe me, I'm absolutely astonished at how quickly Myanmar has opened up in the last few weeks, far beyond my expectations. But I think that's a result of this drip, drip, drip method of every day exposing the Myanmar rulers to the rest of Southeast Asia. And then they can ask themselves the obvious question when they fly to Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, Hanoi, Singapore, why are we not progressing? Why are they progressing? And it's by making them aware that things have changed. And that's what I would do with Iran. Mm. I would frankly, and don't, don't forget that Iran, like China, like India, represents one of the oldest civilizations in the world that has its own cultural traditions. And the Iranians are among the smartest people in the world. Engage them, expose them to the rest of the world, and then over time, you will evolve. What about those who argue that actually the future of Asia may not be that peaceful, and may not mm. always be characterized by an avoidance of conflict because there's a growing anxiety about the, the power of China and mm. the, the way it's clashed you know, with, with the Japanese over the fishing boats, mm. with the Vietnamese, the Indians. Last time I was there were very anxious about their mm. territorial dispute. Aren't things actually a little bit more tenser and more conflictual than you, than you think? Well, I mean, as you know, geopolitics has been around for 2,000 years. <laughs> no. uh, it'll be around for another 2,000 years. And whenever you have rising powers, it is natural to have rising tensions. And that's why one of the best things that the Lee Kuan Yew School has done is to raise an $8 million endowment fund to study how China and India can avoid conflict. So we do believe that there is a threat of that happening, and that's why we're investing uh, uh, money in that. So it is possible, and I would say there's a 10 to 20% probability of some kind of conflicts emerging in Asia. I don't rule that out, but I still think there's an 80 to 90% probability of it emerging peacefully. Because remember one important thing, the all, fortunately all the leaders of China and India remember what life was like 30, 40 years ago, right? Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping went through the Cultural Revolution. They know how bad life was then. They know that this is the best historical moment that China has had. This is the best historical moment that India is having. So why waste it? Uh, on conflict. And you have to, in a sense, be almost devoid of common sense to engage in that kind of conflict. And, and, and the, thing that, the thing that's amazing in Asia is some brilliant success stories that no one writes about. I mean, the, China, the Taiwan Straits was supposed to be one of, the, one, of the, one of the most dangerous flashpoints in the world. Today, no longer talk about, talk, no one talks about Taiwan Straits as a, as a geopolitical flashpoint. That's because of a very slow, patient strategy of gradually linking Taiwan economically with China. So in a sense, we're coming back to where we started, where mm. the, a certain sort of wisdom comes out of knowing mm. in your childhood real turmoil, real mm. poverty, and then you can recognize how much you have to lose, mm. perhaps from a, a more advantaged perspective. But since we're coming to a close, could I ask you to look a little further ahead? Mm. You talk about, in the book, about the irresistible shift of power to the East and the rise of Asia. So. What would the world look like? I mean, in, how will it differ and feel different from, from how it does now, say in mm. 30, 40 years' time, when China is easily the world's largest mm. economy, when India's up there in the top three or four? Mm. Um, a shift of power, will that mm. necessarily make things feel less comfortable for the West, or will it be a different sort of world? Well, I, I, I'm going to apologize for my optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that we are headed into the best century 
that humanity has ever enjoyed. And I actually believe that this century will be not just be good for the Asians, because they'll have a dramatic improvement in standard of living. The number of people living in the middle class in Asia is going to grow from 500 million people today to 1.75 billion by 2020. That kind of change you've never seen before in history. But the West will also benefit from this change. And if the West engages Asia in a different way, in an equal way, without trying to be condescending or looking down and so on and so forth, then I think we can have a wonderful uh, new era of human history where, where, I, where I, in, I wrote about this incidentally almost 20 years ago in response to uh, Samuel Huntington. I said we will not see a clash of civilizations in the 21st century. I say we will see a fusion of civilizations and that's coming. What about those who say the environment can't take it, that you know, it may be frightfully unfair mm. But as a matter of fact, if Asians live yeah. like Americans, if they all have cars yeah. and fridges, the world's going to fry. Uh, I completely agree. And, 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 and I think the Asians have got to accept the fact that life is unfair, that even though the, the, the Americans have this incredible number of cars, they refuse to tax their gasoline, they refuse to make any sacrifices, I think Asians got to accept that they will have to grow differently. And fortunately, by the way, you know, in the case of China, it's got the largest solar program, one of the largest wind turbine programs. India has got large wind turbine programs. There's an awareness in the governments that they've got to grow in a green way. But will it happen fast enough? I mean, the last time I was in Beijing, the smog is appalling. You look at the car statistics, I mean, yeah. the number of cars coming onto the roads in China, and one can't see that slowing down because, yeah. you know, everybody, it's a, it's a tool of personal liberation, yeah. people have wealth, they buy a car. Yes, but the, uh, I can tell you, you're absolutely right again, but then look at cities like Seoul, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it was congested, uh, crowded and everything, and then they decided to build a stream, reopen a stream in the middle of the city. They said, we need to get re-engaged back with nature. So that will come. Mm. And increasingly, I mean, if you look at how Singapore has built the largest botanic gardens in the middle of the city, on some of the most expensive land in the city, that's in itself a very telling symbolic sign. Mm. Now, in our last five minutes, I'd just like to come back to this question of, of values. We, we were talking earlier and you said to me, oh, well, yeah. the Asian values debate, it's an <laughs> old one. But I think that, you know, if, as we're looking forward to a more, you know, world in which Asia is clearly bound to weigh much, much more economically, mm. culturally, and so on, a big question is whether the kind of values that we in the West, a lot of people in the West, have c come to believe are universal, mm. uh, certain beliefs in certain forms of human rights, individualism, etc., actually are universal, or whether they stem from a distinctly mm. Western tradition, uh, or, or, uh, or whether, in fact, we're, we're right, and in the mm. end there'll be a sort of, maybe even, dare I say, Fukuyama was right, mm. and that there will be a convergence around a, a universal model which does involve individualism, human rights, democracy, etc. <coughs> I mean, clearly some values are universal. Uh, I don't like to have my nails pulled out. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be tortured in Guantanamo. Uh, I don't want to be hanged naked in Abu Ghraib. You know, it's true. Maybe none of us uh, likes to be tortured. So I think those kinds of values will be universal. And so I, there's, no, there's no fight over those, those kinds of issues. I also think that democracy will be universal, that all societies, would, one way or another, will have to become democratic. But the, the question is not the destination, the question is the route. And I think the biggest mistake that the West has made is to try and export democracy and to say, hey, I'm right and you are wrong. I, whether, you, I, either the, whether you do it by the Iraqi road of uh, you know, invading a country, which is a disaster, or you try and preach to the, the Asians. And I think the, the, the fundamental point I make at the very beginning is that the, the end, we have reached the end of the era of Western preaching. So if these values are universal, and I agree they're universal, let them be absorbed by their own, in their own way. Let people choose them and accept them. And what people actually have not noticed, I mean, even if you look at China, right, which is technically still run by the Communist Party of China, the amount of freedom that the individual average Chinese citizen enjoys today it's almost like 100 leap years ahead of what they had in Mao's Cultural Revolution. Mm. 
So they made an enormous transformation in the quality of life. They can travel around the world. Every year, 40 million Chinese leave China freely and return to China freely. Why? Not because it's a prison, but because it has actually liberated the, the population. So I do believe that it's going to happen. But what's not going to happen is people are saying, hey, you the West, you're right and we are wrong. And if that's what the West is waiting for, then we'll be disappointed. OK, good note to end on. Kishan Wababani, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you.